Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Um, I'm Dan McLaughlin. I'm the director of the Center for Health and Medical Affairs in the Opus College of Business here at St. Thomas. And uh, welcome to all of you who braved this very cold Minnesota night. Thank you for coming. Um, we have a little bet on about how many people won't come, uh, but uh, we see the real steadfast people are here. So thank you for coming. Um, we have, this is a program that's in uh, association with the American College of Healthcare Executives Minnesota chapter. And as we were planning these events, some of the members of the committee said, you know, we really ought to get United Health Group out here because um, they are the big giant in our town. And, um, and in fact, um, even though they don't have direct operations, uh, health insurance operations in uh, Minnesota, they still are a big player, as we all know, in the healthcare system. And so, so that's the uh, kind of fun name we put on our, on our event tonight. Uh, credit to Deb Gordon here from Johnson Controls. <laughs> but, um, but we think uh, United's a great citizen, a good, good part of our community, and a great leader in healthcare. And so I'm going to now introduce my colleague, Jack Militello, who's a professor here at St. Thomas and director of the Healthcare MBA and Executive MBA programs. Talk a little bit about that, and then we'll have an introduction of our guest speaker. Jack. Thank you, Dan. Again, I'm Jack Militello. I'm the director of the, the Healthcare MBA program here. And we have a, a number of our graduates. Uh, in fact, let me just have our graduates or, or students raise their hand just to see who shows up. So, so we feel, they all sit in the back row. I guess that's what you learn when you go to school. Uh, but we feel we're a partner in this process as well in uh, recruiting people. And I would, as a bit of a, uh, an introduction, if you run into our people, hear what they have to say about the programs that we have at St. Thomas. This is one of the many that we do. We convene meetings, we, we have non-degree programs and education programs, and one of our more prominent program is, is an MBA with the United Health Group. So we're very proud of the relationship that we have with United. And, and I'll end the commercial with that and introduce our, the, the chairman of your education committee, Jeff Kaufman. So why don't you come up and, and Jeff, this is a, a chain of introductions. Like, <laughs> it's very exciting. Well, welcome everybody tonight again. The stalwart and the, the important people showed up tonight, so appreciate it. And again, thanks to Johnson Controls for co-sponsoring this event tonight, along with St. Thomas. And we are recording this session tonight, so at some point in time we'll, we will uh, be able to view this uh, on at your leisure. Or uh, what did he say about that again? Oh yeah, I can go back and watch that. So it'll be it'll be great for for us to be able to do that. <clears throat> well, I want to introduce the speaker tonight, Chris Preco, who is the senior vice president of Countable Care Solutions at Optum Health. Uh, this is a great opportunity, as Dan was saying, for us to really understand uh, some of what's going on at United Healthcare Group right now, and and to uh, and to begin to visualize the kinds of potential partnerships uh, that we can have across the healthcare system between providers, organizations, insurers, etc. And uh, and we're all starting to look a little bit alike. If you notice, big systems are adding pieces of insurance. Insurance companies are adding physician groups. All those kinds of things are happening. And so uh, Chris is here tonight to talk to us a little bit about all of that. Uh, he joined Optum Health in 2005 as the Vice President of Network Development and Product Management. And in this role, he developed strategies for contracting with transplant and dialysis providers. Uh, served as the operations lead for the network development department. And then he moved into the role of vice president of disease solutions, where he was responsible for product development and management of care coordination and chronic disease management programs. Uh, I don't know what he did in his spare time, but that seems like a lot to do. Um, in 2007, he moved to the role of chief operating officer for Optum Healthcare Solutions Complex Medical Conditions Group before taking on the role of chief, uh, chief operating officer of Accountable Care Solutions at Optum in the fall of 2011, and in his current role as senior vice president of Accountable Care Solutions in the summer of 2012. So prior to joining Optum, uh, Chris was the uh, CEO of Renaissance Healthcare, a renal disease management company, where he was also the chief financial officer. Uh, his background also includes the chief financial officer role of 130 physician multi-specialty clinic, as well as consulting with hospitals and physician practices when he was with uh, Deloitte Consulting. Uh, he has a BS degree in biochemistry and molecular biology and an MBA in accounting and healthcare financial management from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Chris, welcome. Thank you. Is this, everybody can hear me okay? Okay. No booing when they mention the University of Wisconsin, that's good. Um, well, it's nice to be here. Uh, thanks again for braving the cold. Um, and hopefully what we talk about here tonight will be worthy of uh, you coming out. 
Um, the guy I work for, I work for Optum, as you can see on the slide. The guy I work for, a guy named Bill Miller at Optum, said, you know, given the, where ACOs are at, you should put a unicorn on uh, your, uh, the front page of your slide. Nobody really is sure what exists in this space and what doesn't. And, and I think there's a little bit of truth to that. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of mystery around what is this space. I'm sure there's many people in this room who've got direct experience, but I think for those of you who don't, there's a lot of mysteriousness of what are these ACOs, what do they look like, what are they intended to do, and um, what I hope to do tonight is to take you through some of that. Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit from an Optum perspective, and I'll explain for those of you who may not be aware who Optum is exactly, um, and then at the end touch on what United Healthcare is doing in this space, because those are fairly different things. Um, so with that, um, you know, what we'll cover here is a little bit about Optum and UHC, just to, so everybody's clear on those two entities. But what I'd like to talk about is what we're seeing in the marketplace as Optum going out talking to large delivery systems and large physician groups all over the country. Um, what we're seeing from a market sizing standpoint, you know, some of the basics of ACOs, and I'll apologize in advance for those of you who are familiar with this space, uh, that's gonna be a little repetitive. And then some of what we're seeing from uh, what do we think makes these things successful and who are we seeing successful. Uh, and then as I said, uh, share a little bit about what United Healthcare as the insurance entity is doing in this space. And then we should have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so before we get started here, if I could just poll quickly, how many of the folks in the audience are um, physicians? Okay, how, how many are part of a, not physicians, but part of a physician organization? And then how about uh, part of a hospital organization? Okay, students? And then the dreaded other. <laughs> okay, well, there's a lot of other, okay, okay. So it's a pretty diverse group, um, and I think I'll cover the landscape, so hopefully, hopefully this will hit the mark. So the first thing I think that's useful is, what is United Health Group? Uh, it's really made up of two pieces. One is United Health Care, one is Optum. Uh, United Health Care is the benefit plans, um, and they're broadly divided into what we call commercial or employer-based or individual, um, Medicare and retirement, uh, which is largely the over 65s, the Medicare Advantage programs, and then community and state, which is largely, again, the Medicaid programs that we're involved with, the managed Medicaid. On the Optum side, um, we're a very broad services company. A lot of technology, um, a lot of decision support, a lot of case and disease management. Uh, there's a bank that's part of Optum that runs a lot of HSA, HRA, and, and payment transactions. Uh, there's a PBM called OptumRx, which is a sizable, I think it's the third or fourth largest PBM in the U.S. And, um, and there's some other things in there, a behavioral company, United, the old United Behavioral Health is part of Optum. So really Optum is a collection of services, um, you know, that was, was grown organically, but also um, there was some acquisitions in there. So we, we also, we serve a very diverse, now this is Optum, set of people. We have 60 million consumers that we interact with, about a quarter of a million health professionals, mostly physicians, uh, the pharmacies, you know, nearly every hospital in the country one way or another, um, the health plans and, and so forth. So it's a very diverse, fairly large organization, but think of it as a broad services company. So what is Optum about? I think at its core, um, we recognize that there's some real problems in the healthcare system. And when I'm making my comments today, uh, honestly, I know less about the Minnesota marketplace than probably most of the people in the room, because United doesn't have, do a lot of business in Minnesota. And as you all know, Minnesota is really um, you know, at the front or close to the front in terms of where they've gone with with care delivery and efficiency and, and some of the cost profiles. So we have a bit more of a national view. We don't do much business in Minnesota. So some of the things you're gonna see from me, Minnesota is probably out ahead in a lot of ways. Um, I'm gonna to try to give you some perspective of what we're seeing in the rest of the country. But, but at its core, 
we believe that there's some real fundamental issues in the healthcare system with demand, with supply, uh, with the disconnected nature of the, of the healthcare system in general. And, and the three primary things we're focusing on um, strategically are, how do you attach yourself to the consumer and get more ingrained with the consumer? How do you drive value-driven type care, which is what ACOs are really about? And then how do you help um, modernize the, the you know, largely outdated infrastructure that is the American healthcare system? So I won't get into all the details on this, but a lot of what Optum does is, is driven at one of these things. And we, we largely, um, there's eight focus areas that we have. Um, the ones that are probably most closely aligned to what we're gonna talk about today is this integrated care delivery. But we, we, um, we bucket our sets of services into these broad eight areas here. And most of our businesses fit into one of these areas. Now one of the things I did wanna talk about a little bit is that we are in the delivery business as well. Um, not in the Midwest here, or not in Minnesota, but we have a business called Collaborative Care, which actually has purchased either large physician groups or management services organizations. And it's mostly on the West Coast and in Texas, a few other areas. Uh, we also have a hospice, which is called Evercare. And then we have a company called Inspiris, which does nursing home visits. Again, in certain parts of the country, um, but we are in the local care delivery business, and I think um, this alone is about a $5 billion business for United or for Optum. Uh, so we believe in what we're talking about here. We're, we're not active in all markets in this type of activity, uh, but we are active in some markets with these organizations that we've uh, purchased over time. So... You know, one of the things that's clear is the healthcare system nationally is, is broken in a lot of ways. Pretty much every category of payer is having some major financial problems. Uh, states are sort of broke. The federal government's headed that way with Medicare. Uh, commercial payers and employers, which really make up the, the commercial load, are getting cost shifted to an extreme, and they're going to look for solutions. Uh, in my mind, it'll be very interesting to see what happens uh, when the exchanges come out and whether the employers retain health care, how many of them push that onto the exchanges. Um, I think it could be more than we think. And then last, consumers that have traditionally been pretty disconnected from the cost of paying for health care. Uh, that's, of course, changing over time here pretty quickly. But the, the funding of the, the country for, from a health care standpoint needs to be changed. And I think that's part of what ACOs are about. It's part of what the Affordable Care Act tried to get at with setting up these ACOs. Um, there was not a lot of payment reform in the Affordable Care Act. There was a lot of access, but there was not a lot of cost reform and, and payment reform. So I think you're probably all familiar with just the variation in care across the country. You know, as you can see, Minnesota's in the white, which is, which is uh, you know, a good thing from a cost profile standpoint. The costs, and these are for Medicare patients, uh, the variation in costs can be two or threefold from region to region. And you gotta stop, and this is risk adjusted data for the patient population. You gotta stop and ask yourself, what's going on? Why is Texas two or three times as expensive as Minnesota to take care of a Medicare patient or Miami or wherever? So the, the variation is, and, and you know, a lot of what drives this is the incentives in play in the healthcare system or lack of incentives. There's a lot of trends that are uh, driving value-based payment, which is similar wording we use for ACOs. ACOs is a pretty narrow word, uh, accountable care organizations. It's really just uh, something on the continuum of value-based payments. And ACOs is really sort of an end state of that. But providers, as we go out and talk to them around the country, and these again are primar primarily large medical groups and large integrated delivery systems, they're facing a lot of pressures. Um, they have payment pressures. Uh, there's, a, there's cost shifting. I'll, I'll give you one quick example. We deal with a large for-profit hospital system, one of the larger ones in the country. And on their governmental business, their Medicare and Medicaid, their operating margins were about negative 25 or 30%. On their commercial business, their operating margins were 50%. So as that payer mix degrades on them over time, they're going to have a major problem, um, just, just staying viable, quite frankly. 
So there's a lot of um, you know, CMS push uh, from a reimbursement overhaul standpoint, and then there's a lot of pay-for-performance models that are picking up steam here pretty quickly. So one of the things that's clearly happening, and this is happening in Minnesota as well as other parts of the country, is this convergence between what are traditionally payers and providers. People that are traditionally providers are becoming payers. People that are traditionally payers are becoming providers, as you know, I noted just with Optum purchasing those physician organizations. So these things are becoming less clear in terms of what's what. Uh, we see this all over the country in most markets. Uh, certainly some are out in front of others, but you know, this mix of, of what's a payer, what's a, what's a provider, whether it's a hospital or a physician, is really muddy now. Um, as we go out and talk to these large integrated delivery networks, we're hearing very, very common themes, uh, almost identical. I gotta improve my margin, and to do that, I've gotta get my costs down. How do I do that? Um, I wanna grow my market share. Clearly that goes hand in hand with you know, your cost structure and how attractive you would be to payers. And then how do I start to prepare to manage more risk-based type arrangements? Uh, population health, I'm used to taking care of people that show up, but now I gotta worry about people that don't show up or that go to a different hospital or whatever. These are the three th themes we're hearing over and over again. Um, and these are tough issues and they're certainly, the three of them are interrelated. Uh, but these are, these are um, key things, especially I would note the cost reduction. Uh, it's very difficult for hospitals that have big buildings and large staffs to quickly reduce their cost structure. The answer we typically hear is, I need to run more volume across my fixed cost base. And if you can get the volume, that's great. A lot of markets, and I think Minneapolis probably falls into that, there's not a lot of, of new entrants into this market. It's a slow growth market. Most markets around the country, that is the case, especially with the recent recession, you know, there has not been a ton of growth uh, from a, certainly a hospital standpoint. So what all this leads to is a bunch of key business questions that these uh, large provider systems are asking themselves. Um, you know, there's questions around the distribution system. You know, how do I um, market my services? How do I design products if I want to go down that route to be compelling in the, in the system? Um, how do I manage risk? If that's where payers are pushing me, what do I need to do from a reimbursement standpoint and from an infrastructure standpoint to manage risk? Um, what kind of contracts should I be signing with payers? You know, I'm being approached by shared savings, capitation, bundled payments, you know, name it. How do I think about these things and am I ready for that? So, and then the others um, you know, that are listed on the bottom. A lot of questions, many fewer answers. And again, every marketplace that we see around the country is at a different point. Um, you know, and one of, the key, one of the key issues is, is there a compelling event going on in any given marketplace to push people to move? A lot of times that compelling event is I'm losing market share and I've got to do something. Uh, or my costs are too high, like that example I gave you, and I'm losing too much money on the Medicaid or the Medicare space. So something needs to be pushing people to do something different. Oftentimes it's those two things I mentioned, but it can be other things. So how do we think about this? Um, I think that these reimbursement models is clearly a spectrum of things, and most people go through some kind of continuum like this. You just don't jump right to capitation typically. So we started off with a lot of pay for performance, then there was a lot of primary care medical home type bonus payments, then you had a lot of uh, bundling type activity, um, and that bundling, I used to run our transplant business at United, we've been doing bundling for 10 or 15 years in a business like that, and the transplant providers have gotten very good and efficient at managing the bundle, managing the pre-transplant through 90 days post. And they're, they're now doing much better historically than they ever did. Now that bundling is coming to hips, knees, you know, cabbages and every other thing um, you know, that's driving a lot of MedEx. Where we're really seeing the ACOs focused is in these two on the right. Uh, shared savings contracts where a payer will come to you and say, look, your cost trend is X. If you can bring it in under X going forward, we'll split that with you, um, whatever that might mean. And that's, of course, all negotiated. And then true capitation, which is you know, just a handover of the risk in total. 
And, and the, the, when ACOs form, it's really these shared savings and capitation deals that they're focused on. So what we see is a lot of organizations that have to make this transition from fee-for-service to what we call fee-for-value. Uh, and it's a tough transition because you don't get to go from 100% fee-for-service to 100% fee-for-value in a week. You've got to make a transition that takes time. Um, most of the clients we're dealing with, they're still 70, 80, 90% pure fee-for-service. And what makes them especially nervous is if they implement all sorts of programs to reduce readmissions, to reduce emergency department visits, to prevent admissions to begin with, that's costing them revenue. So as they make this transition and start to work with their physicians to practice differently and, and focus on some of those things to reduce costs, how much does that cost them in the near term for the contracts that are still fee-for-service based? And how quickly can they get those contracts transitioned to fee-for-value where they actually benefit from lower admissions, lower readmissions, lower emergency room visits? That's a hard transition. And I think the best organizations we see, once they commit to this, they move quickly. To move slowly through this is going to be expensive and, and problematic. Um, but a, this is what a lot of organizations struggle with. This is a key point here. So how does that look um, more tactically? And what kind of conversations are we having with these people as they move through these different phases? You know, I think early on, in a largely fee-for-service environment, as people start thinking about this transition, they start thinking about, okay, how do I get the data connected so that I can see the full set of data on a patient so that the physicians in our organization can see what's going on with a patient and, and manage them as, as best they can with a full set of information? Uh, so attend health information exchanges are, you know, things that people think about and talk about. These are complicated um, technologies that are hard to implement and are expensive, um, but, but a lot of people are thinking about them. Certainly, getting all your physicians on an electronic health record, and again, for a lot of Minnesotans, people are probably saying, well, yeah, who's not on a health record? Well, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of people that are not on an electronic record. Uh, probably 15 or 20 percent of the physicians we see around the country are not there yet. The second phase moving through this process is, okay, now I've got this data aggregated, what do I do with it? How do I make sense of it? So there's analytic technologies out there that payers have been using for years to understand population risk, understand what the cost structure looks like. Um, and, and so who are my high-risk patients? Who are my high-risk patients today? Who are my high-risk patients you know, next month and the month after that? There's analytics out there that would allow you to do things like look at um, what is the percentage, what is the risk that a patient will be admitted in the next three months based on their historical claims data and some sophisticated statistics. Uh, so so that's, that's a phase people go through. And then once you have that data organized in a meaningful way, how do you start to get your physicians to practice, to, to get that data, uh, to embrace that data? And then what resources can you add to work with your physicians in the form of care managers or other clinical personnel that can help them manage uh, these very high-risk patients, not only in the office, but outside of the office, and that's probably more important, what's going on with these people at home and other places. This is the kind of conversation we have over and over again, and I think how people think about this. So what is the end state of this? On the left side is you know, sort of today's system, on the right is where you'd like to get things, which is largely a primary care-centered model, um, largely um, a model that thinks about continuity of care through electronic connected systems, um, performance-based incentives, so incentives based on quality metrics, incentives based on panel size, incentives based on team-based care. Um, and, and you can see what some of the metrics tend to look like in really top performing markets. And Minneapolis could be one of those. I don't know what the metrics are here, but um, admits per thousand for the Medicare population of you know two and a quarter, not 300 plus. Days per thousand of less than a thousand. Um, you know, most people meeting um, recommended care, full EHR adoption and high patient satisfaction. So 
there are no markets that I'm familiar with that have all this today. There may be a few that are approaching it in Southern California uh, that I've seen. Again, Minneapolis could be approaching this as well. But overall, taking a largely unmanaged market to a highly managed, effective market should be able to reduce costs by 15 or 20 percent. I'm going to skip through some of these in the interest of time. So moving on a little bit now to what is, how has the accountability market, the accountable care organization market developed nationally? Uh, I suspect many of you are familiar with the programs that uh, CMS has put forward. I know there's three pioneers in this city, um, you know, Fairview, Park Nicolette, and uh, Alina. And uh, that was of the initial 32 pioneer ACOs named. So. Um, there's, a hundred, there's 220 now, what are called Medicare Shared Savings Programs, which are uh, CMS, uh, ACO formed organizations. There's 32 pioneers, there's some physician group practice demonstrations. And then those are just the Medicare ACOs. Um, there's probably twice that many ACOs that take in commercial patients. And those tend to have been around a little longer, certainly like the Boston market would be a good market where there's definitely some ACO-like organizations that have been around longer. So you've got 250 or so organizations being driven by CMS, and there was just a 106 announced a couple of weeks ago. And um, you now have, if you think of Medicare fee for, if you think of Medicare, there's 50 million Medicare patients in the United States, and 13 million are in Medicare Advantage programs. So of the other 37 million, they've already got five, almost five million enrolled in these ACOs. So, and these things just started a year ago. That's actually an astounding move in a one year period. So CMS, I think the, the punchline here is CMS is heavily incentivized to push this along and make sure this is successful. Um, based on my prior interactions with CMS, they're being extraordinarily flexible with these programs. They're trying to make sure that they're gonna be successful. Um, they have a vested interest because, by and large, CMS gets to keep about half of the cost savings attached to these programs. And I think it's one of the answers they have um, to the crisis we're facing here. So it, it's, it's seen a ton of growth, and um, we are seeing a lot of organizations jump into this who have, don't have much experience doing total population cost and quality management. So they're going to need a lot of help. Uh, those pion the 32 pioneers that uh, we mentioned here, um, these were by definition organizations that um, had experience doing this risk management. So we think that um, in total, when all is said and done in three years or so, there's going to be 700 to 1,000 ACOs that have formed in the United States. We did some pretty in-depth market research. Uh, we looked at local markets. We looked at what the competition was in those markets and, and what, have, what compelling event would drive ACO formation. So this certainly has assumptions attached to it, but we're already up to three or 400 or some such number. And uh, we're only a couple of years into this. So 700 to 1,000 is probably as good a guess as any. And um, again, there's, there's a certain amount of infrastructure, technology, uh, analytics, actuarial type uh, expertise that is needed here to be successful. Uh, so where are these ACOs? Um, you know, you can see the darker areas are, are where we're seeing most of them, no surprise. California, Texas, Florida, uh, some in the Northeast. This is a little dated even, um, so there'd probably be some darker areas. But, um, you know, areas that have done more capitation historically have been the first to jump back into these. You know, and one of the questions we get a lot is, how is this different from the late 90s when everybody was taking capitation? There's definitely similarities. Um, you know, I think one of the key, key differences are there's a lot more data that can be provided to physicians and be provided to hospitals around what is the population, what are the characteristics of the population, how does the population look, who should you be paying the most attention to, my sense is in the mid to late 90s, it was just a push of financial risk. A lot of people had no business taking that on. I think this is much more measured. It's, there's a lot more shared versus full risk occurring. So I think it is different, although clearly there are some similarities and hopefully that won't be the same result for those of you who, uh, who were in the industry then. 
So at the basic level, uh, there's a lot of definitions of these things. I think the, the commonality here is um, responsibility for quality and responsibility for cost, and it's total cost. It's not just the cost in your office as a physician or in your hospital as a, as a hospital. It's total cost to that patient wherever they're getting care, whatever care they're getting. Uh, so um, that, that's the, the largely accepted definition uh, and that's how most of the contracts are getting set, is on a full member cost basis. So at, at its basic level, an ACO uh, needs to help accomplish these aims of the triple, the, these aims of the triple aim. Best care, um, cost-effective care, and satisfied patients, and, and driving high quality. And there's a lot of ways that this happens. Um, you know, clearly attention to quality metrics is a key part of this. Um, optimizing what services patients get and the, the notions of wellness. How do you prevent chronic disease? I'll show you a slide later, which is in terms of where all the costs show up. And it's, there's no surprises. It's chronic disease that's driving these costs. Uh, so how do, you, how do you get on top of that? Even if it's a long-term proposition, how do you get on top of that? There are a lot of ACO models out there in the marketplace. Um, and uh, you can see some of the types of organizations that fit into these different models. I don't know that there's any magic to these models. Most of the groups we're dealing with are large integrated delivery systems, so hospitals that have either employed physicians or hospitals that have affiliations with physicians. Um, we're also dealing with quite a few very large physician organizations, 200 plus, I would say is kind of the minimum to make the investments that you need here. Um, but there's a lot of organizations that have played in this space one way or another. Going back to that continuum I showed earlier around taking bundles and, and other things, starting to take risk without taking full risk. So for, those CMS, for the CMS programs I described, those pioneer models and those Medicare shared savings models, CMS had some fairly clear criteria that you needed to meet. Uh, you needed to form a separate legal organization. You needed to have a plan to distribute savings amongst the hospitals and physicians and anybody else who might be involved. Uh, you needed to have a sufficient number of primary care doctors. Um, the minimum was an enrollment of 5,000 patients. So you had to be of a certain scale to even entertain becoming either a pioneer or a Medicare Shared Savings Program ACO. Uh, and there were some other requirements, uh, including pro a lot of processes around evidence-based medicine, quality management, quality tracking. And I'll show you the quality metrics in a little while here. They're extensive, and uh, just the mere collection of this quality data is going to be a huge challenge uh, for most organizations. So one of, the, one of the key elements of how these things work is patients get attributed to a primary care physician. So the basis of these ACOs almost universally is a primary care physician. And a patient gets attributed, which is why you're seeing a lot of consolidation, a lot of, of, a lot of hospitals purchasing primary care doctors. If they're not purchased, they are closely affiliated with a hospital system. Um, a primary care doctor, what you look at is where does any given patient get the majority of their, effectively their E&M care? and then that patient gets assigned to that primary care physician. So, and then those primary care physicians are attached to an ACO, and that's how an ACO gathers its membership. So what you have is um, a lot of complications with this. Um, cardiologists, nephrologists, endocrinologists, all provide primary care services. Um, you know, so there's a lot of issues, the way Medicare did this and the way commercial payers do this, in terms of attributing members to a PCP and in turn then to an ACO. What we're finding is health systems who think they're gonna have 30,000 members in an ACO and when Medicare runs their data, they end up with 16,000. So 50 to 70% of what they thought they were gonna have, which is important because the bigger the pool, uh, the more you can spread the, the investments you had to make to form these things uh, over those lives. So this is, a, this is an issue, again, I mentioned earlier, CMS is highly incentivized to make these programs work. They're dealing with this issue, and I think we'll see improvement in this area. So once you're assigned, 
you're assigned to that PCP, the cost, the full 100% cost for that patient follows you. So if I'm a patient assigned to a PCP and my costs for the year are $7,000, my $7,000 follows that PCP and that in turn goes into that ACO. So that's how this cost profiling gets done and how these risk pools get built up. So how does this really work financially? And again, I know many of you are very familiar with this. There's a trend line that's established, a cost trend line. So you have a baseline of your population. Uh, Medicare trends that based on some national and local trend factors. And then um, you, know, you actually go through the year. Uh, each program year is its own risk year that gets settled. So 2012 would have been a program year, 2013, and so forth. Assuming you come in below, uh, which is a, um, you know, a success to begin with, that gap is what represents um, the savings. Now, 50% of that savings, there's some different models here depending on how much downside risk you want to take, but essentially it's about a 50-50 share with Medicare. Um, so the, the provider system, the ACO, gets to keep about half the money. Medicare gets to keep the other half. Now, why is that important? This, this isn't that great of a business model when I, as the provider, get to spend all the money, 100% of the investment, to make the changes necessary uh, to be successful in a process like this. I only get to keep half the money. So it's not, it's not a great business model. I think it's, a, it's one reason that many organizations chose not to jump into this. There are others, but this is definitely one of them. Um, there are other... Uh, there are other things CMS has done to smooth this. There's an outlier cutoff. The top 1% of patients are held out of these risk settlements, which is interesting because I think in many respects, some of the greatest savings opportunities might be in that top 1% of the patients. So, uh, but from a, from a statistical standpoint, that's what, how they wanted to do it. Um, as you think about your commercial contracts, for those of you that are hospital systems or, or physician groups, um, you know, that's one of the things you've got to think about is do I want to keep all the patients in the risk pool or do I want to trim it off at some point because there's not a lot you can do about a transplant or a neonate or something like that, but there are some things you can do and depending on what those things are that are falling into the top 1%, that, there can be some real savings opportunity there. So let me back up to this for a minute. If this isn't a very good business model, why are people doing this? Um, and I would say there's several reasons. One, um, you could choose a no downside risk option. So you can jump into an ACO model and get this experience and really other than the cost that you have to put into this, you can choose a no downside risk model and if it doesn't work, you say you could walk away effectively without having to pay any money back to anybody. Uh, the other reason is one of the things you get is all the data on these patients. Uh, certainly in the CMS programs, you get all the data. You get three-year history of data. Most provider organizations that are moving down this fee-for-value path have no mechanism to get that kind of claims data, and it's highly valuable. I would submit that some people jumped into this for no other reason other than to get the claims data set and analyze it. And one of the reasons this claim data set is so valuable is you can see for those patients attributed into your system through your PCPs, where is the care going? We have a client in Boston uh, who I won't name, but um, it's one of the big systems in Boston. And when we looked at their three years of Medicare claims data, uh, they about two-thirds of their admissions, and again, these were for patients attributed to their PCPs, about two-thirds of their admissions were going to other hospitals outside of their system. So one really piece of valuable information here is you can get real clarity on referral patterns of your primary care physicians to which specialists, which specialists are using which hospitals. And, and that's very valuable data because what that can lead you to do is to figure out why am I losing so much leakage outside of my system. And there might be more value in this program in recapturing some of that leakage back into your system than there is in this shared savings concept. So it remains to be seen, but a lot of people are paying a lot of attention to that, re 
uh, retention component and how do I keep things within my system? And what's leaking out and why is it leaking out? Maybe I don't have those services. Maybe I have those services, but my primary care physicians don't trust the quality of that specialist. Uh, there's, there's lots of reasons, but um, that's, that's great data to have. And then last, I think the other reason people are doing this is it's just a way to start to get closer to their physician base, to start sharing information with the physician base, to start getting physicians to think this way um, about total cost and quality management, especially if they've been used to, by and large, a fee-for-service environment. So even though it's not a great business model, there's some really compelling reasons people are doing this. How do you save money? How do you create that gap that we saw on the last slide? Well, there's, there's tons of possibilities um, in terms of care management programs, site of service type things, you know, what can be done by a home health agency or in the home as opposed to in the hospital. Um, you know, how do you use urgent clinics? How do you extend your physician hours so people don't go to the emergency room? Things that I'm sure many people in this room are very, very familiar with. So there's lots of strategies and, you know, in general, I think people let the data be their guide. What does the data show? Where are my costs happening? And what strategies should I implement to try to drive that down? So I mentioned earlier, you know, the, um, the cost is showing up, and this might be a little hard to see, but the cost is showing up here, you know, in this uh, just a handful of areas, and it's the usual suspects, orthopedics, you know, cancer, cardiology, GI, endocrinology. Um, you know, these are a lot, of, a lot of chronic conditions embedded in here. A lot of the strategies are in these areas because uh, that's where the money is. This is commercial data. This would look a little bit different uh, if it was Medicare data, but uh, pretty similar. So I mentioned these quality metrics earlier and the quality metrics that you need to track these are the CMS quality, the Medicare program quality metrics. There's 33 of them. Um, there's a lot on this. There was 50 or 60 some in the initial rule and you know people were revolting so they cut it down to 33. Um, there's a lot of stuff on here. Some of it's very clinically oriented but some of it you know, is, is much more difficult. If you look at, for example, item 13 here, uh, screening for fall risk. Now, if you think about how to collect that data from your physician electronic records, you can imagine that, well, if you are on an electronic record to begin with, how many different ways there is for a physician to record that I screened a patient or I counseled a patient for risk of falling. Um, you know, that's not a checkbox in most EMRs. So how do you collect this data across what might be three or four or five or ten different physician practices all running different electronic records the collection of all this is going to be a significant hurdle. Um, the first year of the program, it was a collection only. All you had to do was show that you could collect this data. But in the second and third years, you've got to meet certain baselines on these things or you will not get you. So even if the cost savings does show up, if you're not meeting these quality metrics, you don't get paid. Uh, and it's pro rata, so you can meet some of these and get partial payment. But uh, CMS was not going to come out with a cost only uh, type of a uh, situation without having some clear quality metrics attached to it as well. But this is a big problem, just the, the pure collection of this data. So what core capabilities does an ACO need to have to be successful? And again, everybody's at a different point. Some people have these things already. Some people have to build these things out. Um, so at the risk of overgeneralizing, these are the kinds of things you need to have. You need to have the ability to manage risk, financial and network management capabilities. You need to be able to engage providers. Uh, you, you, know, you need to share data with them. Uh, you need to work with physicians on how they can incorporate care managers into their practice and how to effectively use them. You need to activate members. Um, the CMS programs I referred to are silent ACOs in the sense that members don't know they're in it. They get assigned to it based on who their PCP is, but the members themselves don't know that they're in the program. Now, that's not quite true because you have to send a letter to them and they have the opportunity to opt out, but I would submit that many people don't keep track of that and they don't really know they're in a quote unquote ACO. You need to be able to do population management. Um, 
You need to be able to do performance management at the physician level um, and, the, and the group level. Um, if you're having problems, whether it's with quality metrics or meeting your cost targets, you need to be able to pinpoint, is that, is that across the board for the, all the physicians or is that just certain pockets? Uh, you need to be able to manage across the continuum, including skilled nursing, rehab, home health, home-based services, all those things. And then you need a certain amount of technology. And the technology that I would submit, I've kind of, this is my opinion, bucketed into must-haves and I'll say optional, but highly recommended. Uh, you need to have predictive modeling and analytics so you know who your high-risk patients are. Not only who has been high risk and high cost in the past, but who's going to be high cost in the future. And those technologies exist. You really need to be on electronic records. If you're not, uh, just the sharing of data, the collection of these quality metrics is very, very difficult. Um, you need to, and, and you need to be able to do uh, quality reporting, which connects, of course, to the electronic record concept. And then you need to be able to do medical management across a continuum and coordinate care amongst different providers, different types of facilities. What we have termed here as optional is more of an HIE, a community-wide record. Uh, in some markets, that's more important than others, depending on the degree of fragmentation and, and how much patients use different networks around a, a given geographic area. Member engagement, I would submit, is very important. Um, you've got to have a way to do this. You've got to have a way to engage members um, and get them interested in taking care of themselves. And then you've also got to have a way to pay for all this. So uh, sometimes that takes the form of revenue cycle services. Can you do better from a billing and a collection standpoint? Is there ways to code better to get some additional money in the door to pay for everything that's going on here from an ACO build standpoint? So a, a very uh, common uh, path and a discussion that we have with people is, um, especially early adopters or people that are earlier down the chain just thinking about this, should I, become, should I form an ACO? Is there any reason I should do this? Um, the conversations tend to go, you know, who are your physicians? What kind of a primary care physician base do you have? What's your network look like more broadly than that? Uh, what population are you interested in serving? A lot of, a lot of organizations start this with their own employees because they tend to be self-insured and they're at full risk for those, uh, for those members. So that's very common. Let me do this on my own 10 or 15,000 employees. I'll see how it goes. That's a pretty small population though. The next set of question is, how do I get data aggregated? Do I need an HIE? What's my EMR situation? If I've got EMRs, do I have six or seven or 10 different EMRs? And how do I get that data together? Um, and then it moves down that analytics path. You know, do I have a data warehouse? How do I make sense of this data once I have it combined? Do I have predictive modeling capabilities or do I gotta go buy that from somebody? Do I have actuarial capabilities in house? Um, a lot of this is actuarial analysis and Providers typically just didn't have a need for that, so uh, they tend not to have it. And then once I've got this data, what programs do I want to put in place to try to you know, stem the cost? Ver this is a conversation we have almost every day around the country with providers at different stages of all this. So I'm gonna move forward here. There's, there's certain things that we've seen over and over that are critical, critically important and I'll touch on some of these pretty quickly, but certainly governance and leadership around accountable care organizations. And, and what that really leads to is how do the physicians have a meaningful voice and really run the thing? Because the physicians really need to run it. They need to be the ones looking at the data, making decisions about how do we improve this situation. Uh, so physician engagement's critical. There's information technology that's important. We talked about some of that. Um, clinical performance and population health management, and then just risk management in general. So I'm gonna, I, we've touched on some of this, so I'm gonna skim through pieces of this. Um, one of the things I'll talk for a minute about is what kinds of population management programs are we seeing get put in place? This is fairly generic, but uh, in general, people are trying to manage their readmissions, um, not only for ACOs, but from some of the other penalties that are coming from CMS just in general. Um, everybody's interested as of late last year in managing their readmission rate so they don't get penalized. 
it also happens to you know, bring down total cost of care in a population approach like this. Uh, emergency department, um, what can we do about minimizing uh, the emergency department use? And there's a lot of strategies around that. Uh, but there's both consumer strategies around education and there's strategies around having weekend hours, having late hours into the evening, better access to primary care services in an office. Um, how could we manage complex and chronic populations? So c congestive heart failure, COPD, uh, severe diabetes, end-stage renal disease, these people that are sick that are, you know are going to consume a lot of resources, and how can you help contain that to a manageable level? And then the referral management piece around how have we evaluated the specialists? So if I have the choice to refer to four different orthopedic groups, do I have a bead on which one is the most efficient? Uh, which one takes more people to the OR or which ones believe in more conservative care and will push conservative care? So I think increasingly systems and primary care physicians, because it's going to affect their income, will take a look at specialists and say, who do I want to refer to from a total cost and an overall quality standpoint um, versus uh, some of the traditional referral patterns that I think we've seen. So a fully mature ACO um, you know, has the characteristics that you see here. I think we've talked about a lot of this, but you know, I, I think some of the keys are what kind of financial incentives do you put in place uh, for physicians and other managers? Um, you know, what percentage of my business is risk-based so I can make that transition quickly? Uh, mature ACOs have a clear strategy to get most of their business to the one side of the scale and, and make sure that they don't live in that limbo for very long. Uh, how do I get alignment across the continuum? You know, how do I get buy-in from skilled nursing facilities and home health agencies, not only to share data, but to provide the services that are going to be needed uh, to provide the best cost and quality care for these members? So there's a, a lot of attributes here. Very few people are up on the, fully on the right side of this. Um, some key attributes that we have seen, and this is pretty tactical stuff, to attract primary care physicians to want to be part of this, what's your value, as an ACO, what's your value story to a primary care doc um, you know, to join your ACO? Because they probably will have the ability to get into multiple ACOs, and most primary care physicians can only be in one. It, it just doesn't work if you're in multiple ACOs. So, um, what's your value story to the primary care doctor? What do they get out of this? Um, and, and what they get might be a well-managed, cohesive system that they can earn financial bonuses in. Um, you know, that's a, a clear value proposition. What is the value proposition to payers? Um, what kind of a cost proposition can you put forward so that commercial payers are going to want to contract with you as an ACO? Uh, what kind of infrastructure do you have? Um, and, and recognizing that there is no right answer here. This is, this is very unique to each case in terms of what technology and what infrastructure you need to put in place. What kind of clinical model do you need? What kind of care management programs? Um, you know, what kind of clinical model to support population health? Um, and then I would say probably most importantly, leadership. Physician leadership, other clinical leadership and administrative leadership around making a commitment to this and an executive team, uh, again, physician and non-physician, that's aligned on this vision and believe that this transition is the right thing to do and, and push us forward. Um, what does all this cost to do? What is all this infrastructure, this care management, this technology? There's some estimates out there. I, I know you probably can't see much of the right side of this, but in the blue box, CMS estimated it to be two to five million dollars. So now you get a sense why only larger physician groups and integrated delivery hospital networks are in the group that can afford this stuff. Um, other estimates are much higher. The American Hospital Association estimates five million and up. So this is expensive. This is a major commitment for these organizations to make. And uh, again, uh, some organizations are going into this without making much investment, but I would suggest you know, they're going in for some of those other reasons I mentioned earlier. They're probably not going in uh, with a real eye towards success. Uh, there's a lot of ways to finance this. Um, I mentioned some of the things earlier, um, you know, but depending on the balance sheet and the cash flow that a system has, 
Uh, we get approached all the time by organizations who want to do this, but they don't have the cash on the balance sheet. So, you know, can we defer our fees? Uh, can we loan them money? Can we help them collect their money better? Can they code better so that their reimbursements improve? Can they reduce their costs? Um, how do you do those types of things? So there's a lot of ways to fund this, but it's not for the meek. You know, this is a, a pretty significant investment and it's a strategic imperative. So I don't want to make this a commercial for Optum, but I thought I'd give you a sense for the kinds of things we bring to the table. You know, these, there's various categories of things. Um, we have a lot of the technology. Historically, we've used that in the payer space as we've, you know, as United Healthcare and other payers that we work with. We've managed population risk. So a lot of the things we talked about today, we can bring from an enabling standpoint to the marketplace. Uh, but there's a lot of things that these ACOs got to do themselves. You know, the leadership, physician engagement type things. Uh, so it's definitely a, a combined effort here. I'm going to, and then here's a few of our clients um, that we have. We started this accountable care group about a year and a half ago. We work with various people around the country. Again, as we said earlier, we don't really work in Minnesota, but we work with large physician organizations, large integrated delivery networks around the country. And this is picking up steam, um, you know, really with each passing month. So with that, I thought I'd spend just a couple minutes on what is United Healthcare's view of this? How are they approaching the market? Most of what we talked to so far has been oriented around Optum and what services and what the ACO market looks like and what you probably need to be successful. Uh, United Healthcare certainly is active in the accountable care space as a payer. So they as a payer would go contract with provider organizations on typically on a shared risk basis, you know, that 50-50 concept we talked about. And they are, getting, um, they are getting into this more and more. So they talk about wanting to pay for value, not just pay for services. Uh, and it's these concepts we've been talking about, um, aligning incentives. So um, they are certainly one of the payers out there. Aetna's doing this, Cigna's doing this. Um, many organizations are doing this. Um, and, and again, it's also picking up momentum from a commercial payer standpoint. They do this in both the commercial meaning employer area, as well as the Medicare area. I think there's a, a general consensus that there's more money to be saved in the Medicare population. The costs are just higher. Um, a lot of our Medicare clients, their per patient per month costs exceed $1,000. So there's just a lot more there to get your arms around in terms of potential savings. Um, United thinks about that spectrum that we've talked about. So performance-based programs, they think about bundling under centers of excellence, they think about accountable care programs, these shared savings type programs, they think about all of this as value-based care. And they're fairly selective. Um, they have 15 ACOs now that they're currently contracted with. Um, Actually, they're still working on a few of those. I think they have about 10 that they've contracted with and another half a dozen or so that they're getting very close with. Um, they're pretty selective. They want to do this with people that they think have the infrastructure and, and are ready to be successful doing this. Because again, same model as Medicare, United roughly keeps half the money to the extent these are successful. So they, there's some work to be done uh, to set these up. Um, and they actually have requirements for accountable care uh, partnerships uh, of the provider organizations. So they look for physician leadership with clear governance. They look for uh, robust clinical programs. They look for ability to coordinate care across all settings. They look for the right health information technology, et cetera. And they're probably not going to um, spend the time to contract with uh, organizations that don't have most of these things already in place. And they track, you know, the normal set of quality and outcomes metrics that you would expect, some of the things we talked about earlier. And then usage metrics as well. Are you using the preferred lab? Are you using in-network providers? All those types of things. So with that, um, I'm happy to entertain any questions. I'd, I'd love to get some comments on how this is working in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, or greater Minnesota area. Um, it's, not, it's not a market I know a lot about. I'd be curious how, how far along those markets are. So uh, Chris, so thank you very much. Let's give a little round of applause here.